Today, we are talking about the top 10 games of all time. That's right, you heard it right here. We are finally down to the top 10 games. If you're new here, this is the final video of my top 50 games of all time with Brian from Game Brigade. Thank you for joining me. Before we get too far into this list, I wanna make sure you are aware of how I present my list, how do I formulate my list, because there's a good chance you haven't watched the other videos. I have a three-way system of how I rank a game. The first thing I look at is how good is the game. I ask myself mechanically, thematically, is this game doing things that are enjoyable, that are good, that work well? Is the game doing what it sets out to do? If that's true, it's going to rank higher on the game. If it plays well with the theme of the game, it's going to rank higher in the list. The next thing I look at is how easy is it for me to play this game? Is it have a, does it have a high learning curve? Is there, are the rules easy to come back to time and time again? Or do I have to refresh and read the rule book over and over and over? A great game that is incredibly thematic and great fun could be held back because the rules are so dense and they require refresher every time you go back. And the final thing that I look at is personally, how much do I like this game? Well, I try to be as subjective as I can be with the first two, the reality is there's biases and everything and I have my own biases. The things that I love, the things that really drive me home, the things that I want to continually keep playing, those games will also rank higher for me. As we get into this top 10, there are going to be some games that I'm gonna have opinions on that will be shocking to you that are in my top 10. Why do you feel that way about a game that you rank so highly? I hope that I can speak eloquently enough to pass on my, my thoughts as we talk about these because there's a very high chance with the amount of games that are coming out, with the amount of new games I'm constantly playing, that some of these games might not find themselves back on this list next year. So without further ado, let's start with number 10. Coming in at number 10 is Endless Winter Paleo Americans. This is by Fantasia Games. Endless Winter was is a, a, a theme that, well, first off, Endless Winter is a game that plays very well in a mechanical style that I really, really enjoy. As we get deeper into this top 10, you will see that resonating through several other games. This is a worker placement deck building game where players are going to be sending out their workers to one of several locations, doing actions, buying different types of cards, and eventually trying to progress on several different tracks. Endless Winter is interesting because it has so many different elements for you to attempt to achieve, to give you a sense that you have a lot of variety in things. Now, I don't necessarily think you can achieve all of them. You've got set collection, you have an area control location, you've got a burial mound uh, section, you've got a racing up this track section of victory point kind of end game scoring tracks. There's a lot of things going on. It can even be modified with some of the expansions or modules that you can include in every playthrough. It gives you a lot of things to do, which I really appreciate. On top of that, I believe Endless Winter is one of the most well-placed mechanically ga done games in a thematic setting. Like, it's taken the mechanics of the game, the things you're doing, and does a very good job of blending and seamlessly inserting the theme into the game. The, the area control section where you're migrating your tribe to different locations of the tile makes sense. You're migrating your, your hunter-gatherers, you're moving, you're constantly setting forth. Uh, you have the set collection where you can collect different animals, but you can kill them and, and, and kill an animal to get resources like meat. You have the burial mounds where uh, you can uh, eventually no longer have access to a certain card, but you'll put them into their burial grounds, which will still count for points. It's, it's just a very well-made game. The thematics of the game are, are really good. I, I just love all the aspects of this. I will say the biggest interesting point, it's not a downside, it's not really a positive thing. 
There are a lot of module expansions that are included that you can swap in and out, but they are direct replacements. Like if you wanna play with these other cards, you have to play with those and you have to take the base game cards out. There's no mixing, there's no combinations of the two because they have mechanics that don't work well together. Same thing with the animals. If there's a certain t another deck of animals that are available, you're gonna have to take the base game element, animals out and add in the, the extra animals. It adds an interesting gameplay mechanics. There, it allows you to play with different types of leaders that have different types of asymmetrical powers. It's just interesting that you're not able to mix and match as freely as one might want. I love this game. It was higher on my list. I think when I originally got it, we played a lot of games of Endless Winter, and I would say it's kind of tapered down as there's other games that are part of the same niche that just are just a tad bit better for me. It's still a great game. I would never say no to playing it. That's Endless Winter at number 10. Coming in at number nine is Terraforming Mars by Stronghold Games. Terraforming Mars is one that I think has just been a mainstay in my top 10 since I originally played this, I feel like in 2018. It's just, it's just a mechanically well-made game. It's got a ton of expansions, which I don't necessarily think you need, but it gives you the variety of playing with different types of modules. It's got a really cool, um, again, unnecessarily needed uh, 3D terrain pack that allows you to build up Mars. I love a lot of aspects of Terraforming Mars, but I think the thing that really makes this game so well made is the ability to start the game off have a little bit of a direction where you can go based on your corporation and really start seeing your engine developing as you progress through the game, through the card drafting and playing out your tableau. It's a, it's kind of a, uh, a tableau building, set collection, uh, tag matching game where you're trying to match different things to things you have in your tableau. I really, really enjoy Terraforming Mars. I think it's an elegant game. I really have enjoyed every play of it. Although at times it can run along long in the tooth. It can, it can have a long feel to it. But I have always felt at the end of the game satisfied with how it completed, how we've all worked to Terraforming Mars, racing to get up each track, the oxygen track, trying to collect the different water tiles, and eventually raising the temperature. It's a load of fun, and I love Terraforming Mars. This next one is definitely, definitely surprising that it's coming in at number eight on my list. That is Castles of Burgundy, the special edition. Now this is from Awaken Realms. Awaken Realms did not design this game and you were able to get uh, Castles of Burgundy at a much lower price point and still get all of the excitement and enjoy enjoyment level that this game provides. Now I have a review of Castles of Burgundy. I would highly recommend you watching that if you are truly interested in learning more about my thoughts of this one. I rated it very highly. In fact, it's one of the few games I gave a nine plus rating to. Too. That is very rare for me. Castles of Burgundy will have players taking on a unique board, a castle board, where you are going to have to try to set different types of tiles in locations based on dice rolling that you're going to have to assign to those locations. But it's not that simple. You have to buy the tiles, you then have to put them into your bank and then have additional rolls of dice to place them in those locations. It takes time. There's always gonna be someone taking a tile that you're gonna want and it becomes a very interesting little puzzle as you try to fill out your entire burgundy board. I think the game is in its simplicity. It's it, the way the rules are easy to understand and the way it allows people to just feel like every decision they do matters. And I like that feeling. I like feeling like things I'm doing matter. I'm affecting my board. I don't feel like I'm having dead turns. It's always a good time. I would highly recommend you checking out this game. If you can't afford the, the special edition, that's okay. You can find very good budget options on Amazon or at your local game store. I would definitely recommend checking it out. This is one, as I said in my original review, everyone should have this game in their collection. Coming in at number seven, a bit of a surprise here, would be Dune Imperium Uprising, and this is by Dire Wolf Games. And I say surprising because this game by itself is one of the reasons I'm having a confliction on my top 10 list. 
See, many of my friends would take Dune Imperium Uprising and wrap it into another game, Dune Imperium, the original version of this game. But I don't believe that's fair because Dune Imperium Uprising, while using 90, 80% of the DNA of Dune Imperium, there's enough differences to make that this game feels in many ways like a different experience. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I love this game, but also don't like this game. See, Dune Imperium Uprising took a lot of the ideas that Dune Imperium has and changed it, fixed it, maybe make it worse in some ways as well. It makes a game that's very tight with good, interesting mechanics. The combat is more visceral and, and impactful, but almost in a bad way sometimes. The spies allow you to feel like you're always able to do something if you're able to interact with the board. It has a lot of going for it, but I have a hard time because going forward, I can't see a world where Dune Imperium Uprising and Dune Imperium will find themselves on a top 10 list like this one again. It's hard to have two games so tightly matching in theme and play, both sharing such a high spot. So I find myself very much at odds with this game. I love this game, but I don't want to play this game as much as I want to because I love Dune Imperium as well. We'll talk about that more as we get to that, to the higher up, obviously up in this list. Because uh, I think I can have a better conversation when we get to Dune Imperium. So for right now, number seven is Dune Imperium Uprising by Dire Wolf. Coming in at number six, surprisingly, I think for many of you, especially for my longtime viewers, is Twilight Imperium 4 by Fantasy Flight Games. Twilight Imperium 4 has been a top five anchor for me for years. In fact, this game was my number one or two game for many, many years. and I didn't think it would ever find itself falling out of the top five. See, Twilight Imperium is the 4X pinnacle game for me. It has the combat, the exploration, the negotiation, the politics, the technology uh, advancement. All of the things that I love about a very good 4X game are found in Twilight Imperium. This game is so fun, but yet so hard to get tabled. And I think my love affair with Twilight Imperium has been waning because of the last few plays that I've had been less than stellar experiences. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that there was a, there was a notable snub of Nemesis, a game that I love yet have a love-hate relationship with. Nemesis found itself out of the top 50 because it has one thing that I just can't really get back behind it with. It has the potential to have incredibly high experiences and incredibly low experiences. In a game that can be so volatile in terms of my enjoyment level, I can't see wearing, warranting a top 50 position. And that's why Nemesis was somewhere in the 70s for me. And unfortunately, Twilight Imperium, which went from consistently always great moments and times and memories, has in the last few plays been very volatile where I've had a mediocre experience or a negative experience and that scares me. I don't know if it's because I've played this game too much I've played it a lot. I've probably have over 35 or 40 plays of this game, which is shocking to some, but there was a time where we were playing this every Saturday for a good solid four months. We were jamming Twilight Imperium out as much as we could, playing as many games as we could because we loved it that much. I just find myself lately having a hard time wanting to bring it back to the table. It's almost at the same time when the expansion came out which added, in my opinion, a lot of more variety and options for players. It gave you leaders, it gave you more exploration options. I thought it would be a better feel. But for some reason, it's just been not as enjoyable as it was in the past. So while I still think Twilight Imperium wins in the first category of being a great game, setting out what it wants to do, I think the rules are actually fairly easy and I could teach anyone to play this game in 10 minutes. But 
my love for the game is waning a little bit. And I think the only way to correct it is to play the game more. But the problem is, is I don't want to play the game more. There's other games that I want to play that fill some of the similar niche, like Axes and Allies. The second edition, or the the second edition Renegade version just came out for Axis and Allies, as well as the uh, the 40th anniversary edition is coming out very soon. And I'm like, I'd rather play that in my epic long game night days rather than sometimes Twilight Imperium. So I think that's the fault in the problem Twilight Imperium is facing for me in my collection. It has an upward hill battle for it to reclaim itself back into a top five spot, but I don't see it getting there as long as it's not being tabled enough. So with that, that is number six, Twilight Imperium. Number five, I don't have the box right now. It is way up in storage because we have finally finished the campaign and I put her away. But that is Oathsworn into the deep wood. I think it's very cool that Oathsworn is holding so highly for me at number five. I don't know if it will stay there, obviously, because the next time I play Oathsworn will be in several years when I'm ready to go back to it. Maybe there's a second edition, or not a second edition, a second uh, retelling or something. But I've completed the campaign. I've done what I've set out to do. Oathsworn, if you don't know, is a story-driven boss battler campaign game where players are going to go across a campaign of 21 different scenarios where you're going to pick one of about... 12 or so different types of champions with all different types of unique abilities that you are going to play cards with. Uh, it's kind of a card battling system uh, with a battle flow. I've made several videos on this. I would highly recommend you check it out if you're interested in Oathsworn because it is an experience I think everyone should have. I eventually have just beaten Oathsworn. It was a really, really kind of like a sad yet fulfilling moment uh, I told my friend that I played the campaign with, I was like, wow, like, I'm glad it's done because we've beaten it and it's we're, we're done. But it was a little bit like, man, I, I didn't want it to end just yet. I wanted to keep exploring my characters. I had switched several times. I started off as the Penitent. I switched to the Witch. Um, I then started playing as... Um, the Grove Maiden, and I then went to the Blade, and finally finished out playing both the Penitent and the Blade at the same time as my two characters. I enjoyed being able to experiment and play with different champions, feeling how their movements are, feeling how they feel unique and different to each, each other. It's a really, really well-made game. Again, though, just like with Twilight Imperium, it's being held up right now because of the recency bias. I just recently played this. I had such a great time. And while I do think it's worthy of a top 10 slot, such as like Terraforming Mars, is it going to fall in that top 5 spot? Who knows? It might. It's a great game, and I'd recommend you checking out if you haven't already. And that's Oathsworn Into the Deep Wood by Shadowborn Games. The next one, I also don't have a box because I don't even own the boxes for this game anymore. They're just stored in card rows. And that is Marvel Champions, the card game, by Fantasy Flight Games. Marvel Champions is a living card game using the Marvel IP as the name sounds, where you are going to pick a different hero with their unique ability cards. There's about 15 or so for each champion. And you're going to build a deck of uh, aspect cards that are, they basically are cards that are in line with a certain type of role. You have a leadership, you have protection, you have aggression, uh, you have uh, protection, I don't know if I said that already, the green, yellow, uh, um, blue, and red. I can't remember if I said them all, but those are the colors. You're going to build a deck with those cards, and then you're going to play against uh, a, a villain of some sorts. This game is completely modular in the sense that you can play with any hero, with any type of aspect you want, against a villain with any type of encounter cards, you know, you have to play with the villains cards, but you're gonna be building an encounter with them and you can add or put in as many of those as you'd like. They have recommended ones. They'll tell you with this villain, like if you're playing against Rhino, we recommend these types of encounters. But you can completely ignore that and play with whatever you want. 
It plays great at solo. It plays great at solo two-handed. It plays great at two players. It's a little slow at three or four players because of the downtime, but it's still good, if not a little bit more challenging for the entire team, but it's still very, very good. I love this game. I love having unique decks. I love talking with my friends and be like, okay, what are you gonna play? I'm gonna play Rogue today. I, I just built a new Rogue deck. I wanna try her out. Last week I was playing Captain Marvel, although I played Captain Marvel for a long time. She was my favorite champion that I built. I normally have about 10 or so champions built at a time. Uh, I, I just love the system. I think it's so elegant, so well made. It is hard for me not to recommend this game. And that's why it finds itself so highly on my list. It's something that I have no problem investing into this game and, and getting enjoyment out of it. Although I will say I am becoming to a point where it's harder for me to play all the content that I've bought. You know, you have so many campaign decks coming out, then you have more champions coming out. It turns out there's even more champions. Uh, Deadpool just got released, and I'm like, I don't even know if I have Deadpool. I haven't even played Gambit yet. It's just so many heroes and champions. It can get overwhelming. If you are new to Marvel Champions, if you're new to board gaming in general, my best tip is, is that you don't need to own everything. That's a trap that a lot of gamers, including myself, fall into feeling like I need to own everything. Buy heroes that you're in love with. Buy heroes that fit kind of your theme or something that you enjoy. I have actually started saying no to several Marvel Champions characters, even though they have cards in their pack that are very, very good. It's just something I'm gonna have to live without. Talk, looking at you, Spider-Ham. I hear you're incredible, but I don't want you because I don't, it's just weird to me, but whatever. Yeah, I love Marvel Champions. I think it's an incredible game. It's one of the reasons why my Lord of the Rings card game has fallen down on my list because when I'm looking at either of these two games, both living card games, which one am I gonna go to? The easier one to play, the one that's a little bit more elegant in its design, is Marvel Champions, and that's the one that, that usually drives me forward. Okay, time for some more discussion. Coming in at number three is Dune Imperium by Dire Wolf Games. Dune Imperium has held a number three spot for me for the last year and a half. Once I was able to get Dune, Rise of X, and Immortality all on its own, this game became just an incredible experience. I don't think I explained what Dune Imperium is when I talked about Uprising, so I'll give a chance now to talk about it. Dune Imperium is a worker placement deck building game, very much like Endless Winter. So you can see that theme of these deck building um, worker placement games. Very much I enjoy card, as you can see, I enjoy card play based games. I love playing with cards. I love handling cards. This game allows you to uh, send your workers out to different locations based on the cards that are in your hand, gathering some type of resource, eventually uh, contributing units to the battle to get victory points or additional resources from that. What I love about Dune is the variable ways that you can look at the game and figure out how you want to approach each game based on the asymmetrical hero you have, based on the cards available in the Imperium row for you to purchase, based on the actions and the available locations your opponents have taken. It makes every single game feel completely unique and apart from the others. The expansions, Rise of X, changes a little bit of the main board, fixes some of the things that were probably a problem in Dune Imperium uh, that people noticed. I personally never played, I have yet to have never played Dune Imperium's base game alone. I waited and waited until Rise of X and I purchased both of, the, both of those together because I was told that was going to be the best way to play the game. But yeah, Rise of X changed the board, giving some of those base game options a little bit of a rework and added a whole separate board which included an additional unit for the combat zone, the Dreadnought, as well as technology that you could purchase to give yourself an additional uh, asymmetrical booster power against your opponents, giving you even more options for you to play. Not only that, did it add more cards to do more combinations into the Imperium row for your deck building options. Deck builders need to have enough cards that players can find combos or synergies for them to play with. 
And that means you need to have a pretty healthy amount of cards in that library for you to play with. That's one of my complaints about Dune Imperium Uprising, but we'll kind of talk about that when I talk about them together. Immortality came in with even more cards, a new version of how those cards are integrated with the graft mechanic, allowing you to play two cards at the same time, getting benefits from both, and then an additional board would let you move up and get different types of victory points, uh, intrigue cards, or just another track for you to get to for more powers and or abilities. I, I love the way this game gave players the agency to choose how you want to approach the game. How do you want to send to your locations and, and fight versus your opponents based on your turn order, because that matters, the things in a row. Dude Imperium was a wonderful experience that I never would say no to for game night. In fact, we played this probably more than any other game during our regular game night sessions this year than I can think of any other game. Even when there was games we had to play for content creation purposes or or whatever, people be like, I'm actually okay with playing Dune tonight if you guys wanna play Dune. So now let's talk about these two. I have a hard time seeing both of these together. And I think the existence of Dune Imperium Uprising will in fact probably hurt Dune Imperium's position in my list. I think this being here is going to eventually drag Dune Imperium along with it. Unless there's some sort of changes that come along that are specifically for Dune Imperium Uprising, but that would mean that this game might be completely null and void. What do I mean by that? Right now, these games are very interchangeable in terms of their mechanics and their play. You can take the entire library of cards that I was talking about that make Dune Imperium so good and fully integrate them into Dune Imperium Uprising. In fact, I have done that. I have played Dune Imperium Uprising with everything available, which I enjoyed, but my gamer group didn't because they felt like it watered down the experience that Dune Imperium Uprising is providing. And I don't necessarily think they're wrong. I think they're probably correct. There are cards in here that play into what Uprising is wanting to do. But I also want to do things that this game has and are not included in here. I think these are a little bit too niche maybe too tight in terms of what it's trying to do. And I don't enjoy that. So I'm not trying to make this a review of these two games, but I do want to say that I do think these two games existing together is rare. And it will be a weird setting going forward because a lot of times I see people talking about when they're asking about Dune Imperium, which one do I get? Nearly everyone I see now says, just get Dune Imperium Uprising. It's the better version. It's the new version. And I'm like, but is it the better version? I, I still enjoy Imperium over Uprising. But maybe I'm alone in that world. I don't know. I know I like both games. I just, it, it annoys me. It, it annoys me. I just, I wish that maybe this modified this. I don't know. Who knows? Let's leave it there before we get too far. Okay. So before we get to number two, and number one, I want to let you know that I do think number two could be number one. And I think number one is technically my number zero, which is going to leave some movement going forward in the top 10 as well. But my number two, as of right now, is Blood on the Clock Tower. This game has actually changed my life in some ways. I played this game for the first time at Dice Tower West in 2023 where I played it for the first time on the first night. And it was an enjoyable game, but I decided I wanted to play it again. And then I wanted to play it again. And then I wanted to play it again. And I just, this game just was, was drawing me to it. It's a social deduction game where players are going to be picking a, a role out of a bag. You have a unique role uh, that it, no one else most likely. Now there, there are some changes to that with some specialty characters. But for the most part, every role is unique. And you're going to have a sheet where you're going to have everyone's potential roles on it. And the game is going to have you try to solve the puzzle that the game is asking you to solve based on who the imp or the demon is. It's a really elegant game. I, I get it. It's not for everyone, but it's a really elegant game. And let me go back to my story now. I want to make sure you understood what it was. So after that, that Dice Tower West, I decided I wanted to go home and, and get this game. And I scoured and scoured and scoured until I found it. I made sure to buy it. And then I consumed as much content as I could because I just love this game because it was a challenge for me. I decided, you know what? 
I want to I want to play this game and I'm gonna I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna do uh, if you build it, they shall come, you know, kind of situation. So I built a Facebook group for this game and I started recruiting people locally to come and play. To the point where we now have played every month, sometimes twice a month, a game of Blonde the Clock Tower. And my group is very healthily up to 58 members now. It's incredible that I've been able to find people to share and experience this with. I've made friends that I don't think I would have made friends with previously because of this game. In fact, more people have joined my player group because they came from Blonde the Clock Tower and then they wanted to come and play board games with us, with us as well. This game is an incredible experience and I really wish anyone out there to try it. Now, the problem with Blonde the Clock Tower, and I get this, is that I think really you would have to, you need to have someone who's storytelling the game that understands the mechanics of the game and how to play. Because the storyteller is so integral into the mechanics and the way players interact with each other, how certain interactions occur based on uh, things that can happen in the game, you need to have someone that's very, very good at understanding these roles, who's consumed enough content and seen the interactions happen, that it's you just need it, it's very important. I'm lucky that my friend, Stan, who is another Magic the Gathering player with me, uh, Enjoy storytelling and he wanted to do that he has taken on that burden so that I can actually play the game again Th These are one of those games where I was afraid that I would never actually get to play the game because I had to story tell I'm glad that I can play this game. I look forward to playing it as much as possible. It's an incredible experience So that wraps up blood on the clock tower. I Don't know how to put these games somewhere sometimes the final game coming in at number one is Magic the Gathering. I, I love Magic the Gathering. I think Magic the Gathering is probably, not even arguably, the best card-based game ever made. Wizards of the Coast has done an incredible job building a game that is mechanically, uh, not thematically, but just mechanically well-rounded where rules are made to be understood. And as long as you understand the core rules of magic, they can keep implementing new mechanics to keep the game fresh. And you just kind of, your brain gets programmed in a way to just understand how that works within the world and the rules of magic. I also like that magic allows players to play in any type of environment or casuality level, casuality. I don't know if that's a word, but you could play draft where you are picking a card from three packs, uh, building your deck out from there. You could play sealed where you're just going to be given six packs and you have to build a deck out of those six random packs. You can play constructed where you're going to come with your deck already pre-designed to a format that is similar played cards. And what I mean by that means there are different levels of construction. You have standard, which means only the most recent sets of cards can be played with. You have, um, well, I don't know what the names of them are now, but we had extended or uh, vintage or legacy, which were older versions of cards. So, and they're all gated at certain points. Like it goes to a certain set. So cards going forward can be played. And then the next set, cards going from there can be played. Allowing players to have the deck building options to build a deck that's unique and fun for them. And then you even have Commander or EDH, depending on your veterancy level in Magic, where you're going to have a 100 card singleton deck with a Commander uh, or a leader that is uh, basically the colors of your deck. It kind of limits you to what you can do, but also gives you a little bit of theming. There's so many ways that you can play this game that are for either kitchen top table Magic the Gathering where you're playing with your friends in your kitchen or you're going to a competitive scene up to a pro tour. It's very, very deep for you to enjoy. And I think if I were to tell you my journey into board gaming, Magic the Gathering is the thing that brought me into this. Where I even started my YouTube career was a Magic the Gathering YouTuber. 
And I did that for several years. So when I look at Magic, it is the reason why I love these games and the reason why I like the games I like. If you go back and you look at my last 50 games and you said, what games does Brian like? You're gonna find that there are a lot of analytical and heavy and mechanically driven games because that's the thing that I like. I like heavier games. I like games that challenge me to play different types of combinations. And so I think for the health of this list though, so I don't have to have this discussion every time, and because I think Magic is probably deserving of the top spot, I think I'm going to steal from other people who have made lists similar and say, this is going to be from this point on my number zero. It's basically known that Magic is always my top game and let's leave it there. It will never be topped in terms of what I can have. No game can top it. And I think going forward, we'll do that. But I wanted to make sure I at least talked about that because I think this is a game that's incredibly exciting. It's fun to play. It's gotten a little expensive and I'm not sure I enjoy some of the things Wizards has done in the last few years in terms of their print runs and how they're pushing it. But, but casually, what I do now is I just go and I buy the pre-con decks for Commander and I play those with my friend because we're all playing the same power level. Just pick one of the decks that we have. I have about 36 of them now. Just pick one of them and we'll play. So with that, we're gonna wrap up my top 50 games of all time. I wanna say thank you for our channel uh, sponsors, our channel patrons, and as well as my channel members here on YouTube. You guys are what helps me make this content for my friends and for my audience members here, here on Game Brigade. Thank you patrons, thank you sponsors, and thank you members. If you want to help me make this video or more videos like this, please consider supporting me. Uh, I would really like it if you supported me on YouTube memberships. It's easier for me to generate content for you guys, for you to see behind the scene things, as well as you get notified when I put videos up. I usually will send videos up first for my members so you can see those videos ad free that way. But again, thank you guys for watching the show. I truly appreciate. My name is Brian and I will talk to you very soon.